and there were so many, they were so numerous. So those brothers who were fighting the Assyrians, who were fighting the Hittites, composed mainly of Nubians from the south, brought in by this very important woman. So here you have Moses doing no different than the man he was supposed to have his confrontation with, marrying his sister from the south. So this gives you an idea that at this time, around 1200 BC, the Mediterranean is just flooded with Nubians, with blacks from the south from Egypt and Nubia, fighting wars against the Syrians, selling up and down all the way they found that the Egyptians were mining for tin in Ireland, in the British Isles. There's a, 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 an inscription of Taharqa in Spain they found, looking for metals to fight these people who had these uh, iron metals. So they were navigating all over the place looking for metals, looking for things to help them fight the barbarians from the north, as they called them. So you can see she was so important, she's the only queen, the first person in the world long before the Taj Mahal, the first woman to have an entire temple built in her honor by the Pharaoh himself. Ramesses standing side by side his Nubian queen Nefertari. So Nubians all over the place, as you can see the boy King Tutankhamun as he's waging battle against the Assyrians. You can see the Assyrians here as they're falling down being trampled by the horses as the brothers from the south from Nubia and Egypt are coming and fighting off the barbarians who are coming in from the north. This is important because I'm just painting the picture here. So we'll stop here and we'll change over right quick and finish this thing up. Mediterranean world, approximately the time of 1200 BC. Because one of the positions that, that Vincerma takes is that, that uh, it most probably was the 25th dynastic period that was responsible for the first high culture in the Americas. But I take basically the position that it could have been a period even earlier because of the events leading up to that. You can see here the Nubians were coming in already by the time of Ramesses II, composing the majority, a large part of the Kemetic armies and fighting throughout the Mediterranean world. So they were already there at this particular date. So they can't hold the difference in the time of which they usually assign to Nubian dates of between 700 and no more than 800 BC for the Nubian dynasty, which is the 25th dynasty. So they try to say that the high culture in the Americas makes an appearance in America several hundred years before the Nubians come to power in Egypt. So this is important to show that the Nubians were already in power in Egypt at this particular date. Can everybody see that? Is that clear? So this is the Gulf Coast. This is just a few kilometers down from the pyramidal site which we call La Venta. And so sometime about 1200 BC, a little more, a little less, a foreign people came on this particular coastline. All the scholars who have studied America agree on this, that a foreign people came by way of the waters. As you can see, the jungle comes right up to the waters here. And in the midst of this particular jungle, they built the first pyramid in America. They all agree with this. The problem is, who were these foreigners? Now, of course, as we saw all these pictures here when you came in here, to have their, if they would have their way as scholars, you have to throw all this out. You can't look at this and determine. They want more facts. Okay. So here it is. This is the first pyramid in America, approximately 100 feet in height just made an appearance on the Gulf Coast. 1200 BC, no antecedents, no origin and evolution of pyramid buildings, no, nowhere, there were no Mastaba tombs like there was in Egypt, a single tier which became two tiers, which became three tiers, which became a step pyramid, which they put limestone to make a true pyramid, made it built a bent pyramid, a square pyramid, a round pyramid. There was no natural origin and evolution of pyramid building here in America. Just one day, 1200 BC, this pyramid showed up on the Gulf Coast. And so as I arrived just, just over a week ago, in La Venta, a couple of weeks ago anyway, right in the airport, Villa Hermosa, they have a mirror on the wall, and they show the La Venta complex facing the waters. Not only did they build it right here near the coast, but it's actually facing the waters from which these people had come. 
point does possibility become probability? We want to add these things up. It doesn't take anything but really just basic math or something like this. Those currents we saw are coming right over to the coast. You got all these faces right here, and you have this pyramid here, and nowhere else in the world are people building pyramids but from where these currents are coming from. And so here's a model of the pyramid as they estimated it appeared when it was actually you know, in use. And you can see clearly it was a true pyramid truncated without a capstone on it. So here you had a true pyramid and a step pyramid and a ceremonial center with land use classification all intact, all in one spot with no origin and evolution right there on the coast. Just raising issues here. So this particular civilization, La Venta, on the coast, the Gulf Coast of Mexico, is the parent civilization of the Mayas, the parent civilization of the Zapotecs, the Mixtecs, the Tonatecs, the Toltecs, all the Tecs, all of them, and the Mayas, they all go back to this parent civilization. All the scholars agree on that. The Mayan scripts have been deciphered to some extent, and they now know that there were Omac uh, glyphs that predated the Mayan glyphs, in which the Mayans got their glyphs from. The calendar of the Maya and the Aztec, all the text, goes back to the Olmec calendars. And so right in your hotels there in, in, uh, in Mexico, they don't hide it from you. La Venta, this site dating back to 1200 BC, brought to light some of the most provocative finds in all of Mexico. Enormous sculpted basalt heads with distinctly Negroid features that still puzzle archaeologists to this day. <laughs> because they know that there was a galley slaves. They only, could only be galley slaves. They couldn't be gods and priests. <laughs> The heads are attributed to the Olmecs, often called the spark civilization of Mesoamerica, the igniters of a creative blossoming that spreads to other cultures. However, the unique style and physical features of the Olmec heads were never imitated and remain a mystery. But see, this is one of the most important points. These heads were never imitated. That means that when they came here, it was a unique experience, a unique situation. These were unique people with unique features who came in and flourished and then disappeared. Showing you clearly that this is a foreign people. The Mayas don't look like this. The Aztecs don't look like this. The Toltecs don't look like this. None of them look like this. This is a foreign incursion in Mexico. And so here you can see the pyramid in La Venta. And this was a very rare picture I, I was able to find. It actually shows the layout of La Venta. And it actually shows the place where they had the colossal heads. A colossal head here, you can see three at the top. In front of the pyramid, they found at this first pyramid, yes, some of these heads. Facing the waters of the currents that are coming from a land that you would anticipate having these features. And one thing I want you to notice also is they had burials here. You can see a sarcophagus at the top. And they also did a, uh, a test of this particular mound. And they now believe that there is a tomb inside this pyramid, in the center of this pyramid at La Venta. So you can't say it was just a temple. This particular pyramid was a tomb, just like it was done in Kemet. And so here's one of the faces that was found in that particular area. Again, features that were alien to the Aztecs, the Mayans, and all the other texts in that area. Completely alien features here at La Venta. And I like to shoot the profiles of them because a lot of times they like to just shoot them straight on so you can't see the prognathous jaw, the thick lips, and the noses, the characteristics, again, that you would anticipate amongst African people and African people in the diaspora. We move on, we can see here, as my wife sits here, you can see clearly her features in conjunctions of the features here. Again, a totally, look at the problem, like this jaw here and the lips here, completely alien, completely alien to that of the Americans, the Native Americans here. Now look at the profile here, look at this, look at the jaw here. Now I take you to Kemet, to Hermachus. people in the world who were sculpting massive stone heads anywhere in the world other than this and they're building pyramids and uh, this particular one here 
uh, one, one called a monkey, somebody called a monkey, so I shot this picture, and I wanted to show you what they, what they said about this particular one in the, in, in the book as I read. Uh, this basalt pillar topped by, by a face staring towards the sky is one of the enigmas of the OMAC world. Again, uh, another enigma, a puzzle, or something, right? What is this creature apparently lost in contempla contemplation of the heavens? Is it a star worshiper or an astronomer? Is it a man or could it be an animal? Some specialists have suggested, in fact, that it is a monkey. <laughs> so I said, okay, let me take a picture of this thing here. I couldn't. And look at this. Look at the lips. And look at the ears. Look at the afro. No monkey has ever had an afro like this one. <laughs> You can even see the hair like he looks like he has sideburns. <laughs> and his arms are in a position behind his head, showing that he's supporting his neck as he is looking into the heaven. Now what was a monkey do looking into the heavens like this? <laughs> so he's puzzled by this piece. <laughs> Enigma. Then right across the ocean where the currents are coming to this particular region, you find the very features in this land that they refuse to recognize even the possibility of these people coming across to America. Completely alien. Completely foreign features. One time, a spark. Professor uh, J.M. Melger uh, wrote a paper here in Mexico in 1871. 1871 about the De La Cabeza, Colossal de Tipo Ethiopico, the Colossal Ethiopian stone face that he had, he had witnessed too. So I'm not going to leave you to uh, hang it. I'm going to put it all in English. And, 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 and as the scholars would say, in no uncertain terms. We're going to put it in no uncertain terms. On my arrival at the Hacienda, speaking as Mel, Melger, at, my, at the Hacienda, I asked the owner to take me to look at it. We went, and I was struck with surprise as a work of art it is, without exaggeration, a magnificent sculpture. But what astonished me uh, was the Ethiopic type represented. I reflected that there had undoubtedly been Negroes in this country, and that this had been the first epoch of the world. Now here's an anthropologist back in 1871 who has come to this conclusion and has, has written papers on it. But this has been hidden from us. Matthew Sterling, they're just digging these things up all over the place in that area, all around the Gulf Coast. Standing there, all standing there in shock, looking at it. Oh, here's another one. <laughs> starts measuring it, looking at the nose, knowing it's nothing like his nose. Look at his nose. Look at his nose. And look at the nose on this. Look at, look at his lips and look at the lips on this. Look at his cheek. And his receding cheek. Here's a prognathous cheek. All of the dimensions that he's measuring clearly seeing that this is different. And his original position was that these were African. And when the scholarly world, the schools and universities and then the supporting money got to him, he changed his story, Mr. Matthew Sterling. you get a face like that? What in Africa? In fact, they called this head Joe Lewis when they saw it because Joe Lewis was a heavyweight champion at the time that this head was found. And so I put Joe Lewis here so you can see why they call that face Joe Lewis. And Joe Lewis was wearing him a helmet too at that time. Digging them up in the swamps, walking along, tripping over them, stumbling over them, finding them all over the place. The tinge on the lips, the nose, the jaw, the same continuous. All of them wearing war helmets. This particular site here called Kamakalko, which is also near La Venta, probably no, no more than 50 miles from that particular area. But some 15 to 1700 years separate these two buildings. This is Maya. This is classic Maya. This is the only building that the Mayans built out of bricks in the entire land, which is a puzzle to me too. Just one day near the coast, the Mayans jumped up and built a brick pyramid and never built another one. And there's no history of it, of them having ever built one before. A, a fire brick. 
Not just some brick they let sun dry, but they fired the brick. And you can see here, he's holding up the brick here, showing you what they built it out of, out of brick. And what's important also about this site, even though there's a period of time of maybe 15 to 1700 years to separate these two sites, Leventa and this site, it's continuous. The theme is continuous. The, uh, the urban planning, the structure, the architecture, all of it, the theme of the ceremonial center goes all the way back to that of the Omec. You remember the two arms of the village that you saw in Leventa? They had the two arms here, the pyramid in the center, and they also had burials in this particular site. Again, dispelling the rumor, the rumor and the myth that these were only temples and not tombs. As you can see, the two arms of the village at Leventa, the basic theme prevailed. There are buildings underneath this, they haven't even dug it up yet. You can see them here. Here's the seven wonders of the world. Only wonder of the seven wonders you don't have to wonder about. Right there in Kemet. The first monumental structure made by man. Over almost 3,000 years BCE. 5,000 years ago. The light tower is gone. The hanging towers of Babel, gone. The statue of Rose, gone. All those wonders of the world, gone. The first wonder is still there. So all the pyramids of the earth, if this hypothesis holds up, goes back to this particular pyramid, the pyramid designed by the multi-genius Imhotep for the pharaoh Zoza in the third dynastic period in Egypt. Again, whether it's Teotihuacan, the step pyramid of Zosa, or the pyramidal superstructures even in India, which we haven't even got into, go back to this particular type, or this particular pyramid. The Great Pyramid of Khufu. As you see, they experiment with every type of pyramid. True pyramid. One looks like a gambrel roof. Square pyramids. And even had stellar stones around the pyramid, which is something that is really mind blowing because you see the stellar stones here. Because a lot of the American pyramids also have stellar stones in front of them. All these ideas you see coming over here, and we're not supposed to look at the parallels. We're not supposed to add these things up. And you can see again all the pyramids throughout Kemet and also Nubia. As you see these pyramids in Nubia, look at all those pyramids in the background. Every one of them has a temple attached to the tomb. So we're talking about temple tomb complexes. We're not talking about just burials. Again, if you look carefully, this is not just a temple, it's a mortuary temple. And right next to this particular temple was a temple designed by Mentu Hotel, who preceded the Queen Hatshepsut. He was in the 11th dynasty. Hatshepsut was in the 18th dynasty who designed the other temple. So here you can see again the pyramidal superstructure in conjunction with the temple, again a temple tomb concept. Constant. So as I climbed these steps at Palenque, I had this in mind. The priest king Pakal here. And you can see here's a passage that you can walk right down the, the tomb here, inside the tomb, and down inside the temple buried like a pharaoh in Kemet was the priest king Pakal, just like the Great Pyramid. Here's a sarcophagus, Pakal. With, with inscriptions. They call this the Temple of Inscriptions. No one else in the world making sarcophagus like this. But the brothers and sisters in ancient Kemet. So at what point does possibility become probability is a question I want to continue to ask. The biggest problem with this particular civilization, again with the Mayan civilization, is that heretofore they had saw the Maya as basically coming into existence basically between 300 BC and 100 BC for the, for the uh, antecedents of that civilization. Then they have the classic period, the post-classic and so forth and so on that runs into the century. So they were saying that there was too much time to separate the Maya from the Egyptians to, to draw these particular types of parallels. So this was a critical problem. Because here you found pyramids, you found Mastaba type pyramids here in Kamakako. In this area you actually found a burial. In, this, in these uh, cylindrical clay uh, containers, they actually buried the dead in fetal positions. Right at the base of the pyramid here. 
So there was no problems with the burials. As you can see one of the burials here that came, in fact, this is the museum right there on that site where they actually show it was removed from his fetal position and placed in the, in the uh, museum there. So they had burials in conjunction with their pyramids. As we, we see in the very beginning, the first pyramid in America has a sarcophagus and also a burial, as they stated recently, that there's most likely a tomb inside this particular pyramid. This is important evidence because this evidence here has just recently come out in the last, last year. It just recently came out last year. There's a new site, a new Mayan site called Negbi, which is northern Guatemala, which if you look at the scale, is just a little bit over 100 miles from Tabasco from La Venta. And at this particular site, they found the oldest Mayan site to date. This site has been dated between 500 and 600 BC. This is a very important find because what it does is it brings the Mayan civilization, all these elements that we've been witnessing that are so similar to that of ancient Kemet, it brings them closer to that date of the Omeka, which again runs from 1200 BC to about 500 BC. So here you have the Maya at the mainstream or at the very end of the Olmec civilization becoming the power in this particular land. So you can see here the relationship between the, the Maya as the Omeka began to give way, the Maya began to come into power. 600 BC, this is incredible because they now, they're gonna have to rewrite all their books. <laughs> Up to now they said the Maya didn't come into existence until 200 to 300 BC. So this brings the Maya within the mainstream of the influence of the Omeka. So this will account for many of the similarities that we see that they have been able to conveniently keep away up to now. Here's an illustration of that site. It was a bad illustration in the paper, but this is all I, had, I could get my hands on. Just announced last year, uh, around February or March. So then you can see the Maya, uh, where you can see when in the process of conquest, as they treat their prisoners of war by the grabbing of the hair, this is a theme that we see all over Kemet. As the pharaohs, as they go after the Assyrians and the Hittites and various enemies, the, the symbol of submission was to grab one by the hair. So you can see in the art and the iconography in America, the same processes in the art coming over here in the Maya. Again, that date being a very important date because it brings the Maya within the mainstream of the Olmec influence. This is important. Over and over again, you see the same symbol of submission by grabbing the hair that you saw in Kemet throughout the Nile Valley. This one being at the great temple of Mendelisi uh, in southern Egypt, the brother of Osiris, a Nubian temple. And it goes all the way back to the, the, the palette of Narmer, as you can see in the very beginning as they came down from the south from pre-dynastic times and forged the first great cities in Kemet. Again, that art, that symbol was already there in prevalence. So nobody can question who had it first. The war helmets. Remember we said in the beginning in 1200 BC that Ramesses was recruiting Nubians to fight in his army. He married a Nubian woman who became the most important